Hello and welcome to another episode of the Student Loan Planner Podcast. I'm your host, Travis, and today we are going to talk about something that is really shocking. The fact that most borrowers now that have federal student loans will probably go for forgiveness instead of repayment under the new save plan rules. Now, when I say most borrowers, we're not just talking about a lot of the people that listen to this podcast, which, you know, disproportionately are folks that have six figures of student debt, right? A lot of graduate degree professionals, a lot of, you know, some parent plus borrowers listening to this, a lot of folks with 100, 200, 300, 400K degrees that have a ton of student debt that, you know, rightfully feel a little stressed about that sometimes and listen to this show where hopefully you get a little bit of pain relief, right? I can be your student loan ibuprofen, right? I'm very honored that you listen to this show because obviously, you know, it's not true crime. It's not something fun. It's student loans, and I try to make it as fun as I can. So I thought I would talk about something really interesting where a lot of people that have a modest amount of student debt are going to really pursue strategies a lot more like those of you that have a lot more student debt. And this is going to be a sea change for student loan debt in America because, you know, the typical advice, the typical advice that you give to the quote unquote every man or every woman, right, on a popular, you know, personal finance uh, personality that would say you should do this, this is the rule that fits most people, you wouldn't say go for forgiveness, right? In the past, you know, before the save plan, it was like, well, if you maybe if you could get PSLF or maybe if you have a lot of debt, right? It was kind of like an edge case going for forgiveness versus actually paying back your loans. In the era of will Biden cancel debt or not during the sort of 2022, 2023 era, a lot of people, I mean, I got people coming out of the woodwork texting me, hey, like, should I just like keep like 10,000 left behind just in case Biden forgives some of this stuff? So many people ask me that question, right? And so if we think about that, uh, if we think about that just (laughs) uncertainty, it's just going to be really crazy to see the typical person go from repayment to forgiveness. And let me give you an example of this. If you think about the congressional stuff that that Congress has done on student loans lately, one of the things they did was create the ability to do matching payments. Like if you pay your student loans, you can get matching retirement contributions, right? There have been people uh, pushing for, you know, employers to be able to pay student loans on a tax-free basis, you know, for, for folks like a tuition assistance program, right? Those are programs that are very much geared towards the idea that people pay off their loans. Now, what happens if you have conventional wisdom and, you know, employer-based programs and government, really a lot of state and local programs that all have the same set of assumptions that you need to pay off your loans when the government rules and they're under the save plan encourage the exact opposite of that? That's the world we're heading towards really quickly. And let me give you a couple examples, you know, a little historical examples before we get into the details of today's pod. So most borrowers used to pay back their loans, period, right? With the FELL program, the FELL program essentially existed because you had all these lenders that would, you know, issue student loans and they got guaranteed interest payments from the government. So if people defaulted, they still got paid. And, you know, they did eventually come out with an income-driven option called Income Contingent Repayment, ICR, but it was a really bad plan. And it got pushed through in the 90s essentially because, you know, Republicans didn't care enough to stop it and because Bill Clinton's administration really, really wanted it. And so they just said, sure, let's have this ICR program that looks like it doesn't even help anybody. And it really didn't because it was so expensive. <clears throat> and because that ICR program was so bad, everybody always pretty much had to just pay back their loans, right? And, you know, costs were relatively lower because one of the things that happened too in the 2000s is the FELL program had ultra low interest rates. So back when I first started doing this, I would run into people uh, pretty commonly that had, you know, one or 2% interest rates from the era of the 2000s, where for whatever reason, Congress allowed people to consolidate into FELL consolidation loans, and they were able to consolidate into one, two, three percent interest rates. And so it wasn't that crazy that people could just sort of pay back their debt for the most part, not everybody, but the default path was people paying down their loans. <clears throat> Now, when you have a pay, when you have an interest rate that's one, two, or three percent, yeah, some of it goes to interest. But if your interest is that low, pretty much everybody sees an impact to principal right away if you're paying some sort of minimal amount of money, right? And that's why I think a lot of people paid it down because the interest rate was so low, might as well, right? Now, some people were real strategic in that era, and they realized, oh wow, I can put my fell loans on a 30-year or you know 25-year type of extended repayment plan. And because my mortgages are at four, five, six percent, and int- you know inflation is is high, I'd rather just drag these loans out as long as I possibly can. That's pretty logical, and a lot of people did that. Now, with the changes with the uh, with the save plan, right? The, the the big change with the save plan is really it's really two things. 
One of them is the big poverty line increase or discretionary income increase, right? The amount of income that you're supposed to be able to make before you have to pay anything on it. So 150% of the poverty line is, you know, not small, not large, but it, it is what it used to be before the pandemic, right? To go to 225% of the poverty line, that's a very large difference. So, you know, even a married couple, two people in the household, you can get $45,000 of protected income before you have to pay 10%. Now, if you have no children uh, and you file separately, or, you know, I guess if you're single or you file separately, you're just family size of one, so it's about 34000 of protected income. Now, where this gets pretty interesting is let's say you have a, a married couple with a couple kids, very common scenario in America, right? So married couple with two kids, if you file separately and the person with the loans claims the kids, you get a poverty line or discretionary income, I should say, discretionary income deduction of about $56,000. So $56,000, how many people in America earn less than $56,000? A whole lot. <laughs> a whole lot of people make less than $56,000. Now, what if you make more than $56,000? Let's say you make $80,000, for example. Well, if you make $80,000, you're going to take eighty dollars and subtract fifty six, dollars and that's a $24,000 remainder, right? Now, if you have undergrad debt, you're going to take 5% of $24,000. So that's $1,200 a year. $1,200 a year divided by 12 is $100 a month. So do a little bit of quick math. $100 a month, about $1,200 a year over 20 years. Let's just say it's about $24,000 over 20 years. If you borrow the average student debt, which is 30 to 35, you are now paying less by going for forgiveness than if you paid it back. Because if you paid it back, you got to pay your principal and interest. So if you borrow 30, you're probably paying 35K back of principal and interest, right? And that's not even to think about the effect of inflation. If you're paying back 24,000 over 20 years, imagine the impacts positively of inflation on the payments that you'll make over time. The value of the dollar goes down, so every time you make payments, it's less and less impactful. So you might say, oh, that's ridiculous. You know, like a lot of people, they graduate at 22, they don't have kids until they're 32, so they'd be making years of really high payments. And to that, I'd push back a little bit and say, well, keep in mind, when you graduate school, if you file a tax return, you can get a $0 a month payment. And in the second year you're out, you only work part of the year, most people do. And so you would be only claiming income from July to December. And so you'd probably have another almost $0 a month payment. And then so year three is the first year you would pay anything significant. So let's pretend that you're a typical undergrad. So you're paying nothing until you're about 24, 25. A whole lot of people take some sort of gap or, you know, time away or they pursue some sort of, you know, random professional passion that's not uh, what they got their degree in, right, in, in your 20s. I mean, certainly I did some some random travel around the world stuff in my 20s, right? But let's say you're making, you know, 70000 with thirty k of debt and you're single, right? So in that case, yeah, you would pay a little bit of money. So let's say you're making seventy k a year. Uh, 34k poverty line deduction, about you know 36k left over. Five percent of that's 1800. That's about 150 dollars a month. So even that number, 1800 times 20 is 36,000. So yes, like you know, if you're a single person making 70k or above, it's going to be pretty hard to get for forgiveness. The vast majority of Americans with a bachelor's degree do not make that, right? The vast majority of Americans with a bachelor's degree make more like 40, 50, 60 something. And, you know, again, the typical student loan borrower is not, that is not necessarily somebody coming out and graduating at 22. A whole lot of student loan borrowers take five, six years to graduate, and they might have started off a little bit older in school as well, right? The typical student loan borrower is a lot more likely to have children because you can't really cheap out as much if you don't have kids. Uh, sorry, if you, if, you, if you have kids, you cannot cheap out as much, right? You, you have a lot of expenses you have to pay, right? Uh, whereas if you're single, 19 years old, I mean, you could live in a uh, a shoebox or something and probably have extremely low expenses and it probably wouldn't bother you too much. I'm joking around a little bit, but you kind of get the idea behind this, right? Like, a again, I didn't say that everyone should go for forgiveness. That's not what I said, right? I said most borrowers are going to pursue forgiveness now, which is a real sea change. So if you have like a typical person going for forgiveness, you know, what does that mean, again, about some of these, you know, societal programs that are out there? We'll talk about that in a second. Um, so let's talk about grad school borrowers a little bit for a second. So, you know, with, with PSLF, uh, there was uncapped borrowing. 
lots of people went for forgiveness before the save plan, right? And and why is that? So let's think about the PS Love program. So remember that the PS Love program was essentially designed to fail uh, before 2010. And the interesting little legislative history about the PS Love program is the people who wrote it knew what they were doing. The people who wrote it uh, wrote it in such a way that it would be a lower cost program by excluding fell borrowers. So the people who took out loans before 2010, a lot of them had fell loans. The people who made PSLF intentionally excluded fell borrowers because of the realities of dealing with the Republican administration. And they knew that they couldn't get PSLF through if the cost from the CBO was too high. And so they intentionally left out fell loans to get the bill through, right? And then they got the bill through, and then you're able to essentially look at the 99% rejection rate. Obviously, your typical borrower doesn't understand the, the super arcane technical difference between fell loans and direct loans. And so the typical borrower <clears throat> was really frustrated with the PSLF program. And I remember <clears throat> I remember in the 2010s, a lot of people were, you know, throwing uh, throwing water on the PSLF program saying, you know, it's not a thing. You can't trust it, right? I mean, a lot of the most popular personal finance personalities said that PSLF can't be trusted, you know, very emphatically, very confidently, right? And it's just because they didn't care to, like, read the rules. Like, the PSLF program for anybody with direct loans could get it, but there was not a lot of people that knew about it getting forgiveness for them to fully trust it yet, right? Think about a lot of people making career decisions in medicine. Back in the day, in, like, the early 2010s, very few people make career decisions based on PSLF. These days, when I talk to physicians, so many of them make career decisions based on PSLF. In fact, I would argue that some physicians care about PSLF way too much. People, a lot of times, will, will organize their entire lives around PSLF when the math doesn't even make sense to do that. So in other words, what happens with these forgiveness programs, these new paradigms, is it takes a while for it to get actually like going in people's minds that, oh, like, there are 800,000 people that have gotten PSLF. Now it seems to be a real thing. Maybe I should plan my career around this. <clears throat> that takes time in the same way that it takes time if you have a bunch of undergrad borrowers that used to pay off their loans that should get forgiveness or can get forgiveness but just aren't that aware of it. So, you know, that's kind of my thought process as to how this sea change with the save plan is going to work. I think a lot of people are still very unaware of the save plan. A lot of people are very unaware that they could get forgiveness. A lot of people are very unaware that they could file married filing separately. And when more people become aware of that, that's going to make a massive difference in the amount of people that are pursuing forgiveness. A thought on the number of people on the save plan. There's 7 million people and counting on the save plan, roughly, and the majority of those have a zero a month payment. Now, I don't think that's because people make so little money. I think the real reason there is so many people have not had to recertify their income since 2018, right? So 2018 tax year is the last tax year that most people had their income certified on for their IDR payments. And a lot of people were students or residents, and they have very low payments from a very long time ago. So when people have to recertify their income, I don't necessarily think that a majority of people will be paying nothing on the save plan. But what will also happen is instead of 7 million people on the save plan, I think that you're going to see a lot of people sign up for the save plan because of the benefits. So you're, I think you're going to see maybe 15 million people out of 40 million total on the save plan. Now, that's gargantuan. Like, historically, maybe like 3 million people were on IBR, maybe 2 or 3 million on the repay, maybe 1 or 2 million on pay, and a couple hundred thousand on ICR. So, like... We're talking about the entire amount of people on income-driven repayment, like 8, 9 million. That entire group of people now is already on, this, on the save plan. And it's drawing a lot of people away from the repayment strategy onto the forgiveness strategy because of how beneficial and, and, and generous the plan is for a lot of people. Now, there's another way to get forgiveness on the save plan that I haven't talked about a ton. And we are going to hopefully come out with a calculator to model this for folks. Um, this calculator is going to model the small debt forgiveness scenarios under the SAVE plan. So the way that that works is you can get forgiveness in less than 20 years if you have undergrad loans only, uh, and less than 25 even if you have grad loans only if you have very small debt. So for example, if you have less than $12,000, you can get forgiveness in the SAVE plan in 10 years. If you have um, in between twelve and 22000 then you can get forgiveness uh, every thousand extra you borrow, you add a year to that forgiveness. So if you have like, I think it's 
13,500, I think you get forgiveness in 12 years. And that's your original principal balance too. So remember what I said about, you know, a lot of times people come out of school, they're trying to find themselves, et cetera. If you have a small amount of debt, there's a lot of people out there that could get forgiveness on very, very micro levels of debt. There's even some stuff where married filing joint and separate could come into play. If you file a joint, then your payment is proportional based on the amount each of you owes, right? So if you have somebody who has, you know, 10, 15,000 of loans married to a dentist that has 400,000 of loans, let's say your payment is, you know, 1,000 a month as a joint couple. If you file a joint, you might be able to have a payment on your uh, tiny 10, 10 or 15K of loans. It's like almost nothing, even if you make really healthy incomes as a household. And then, you know, that small debt person gets forgiven in 10 years, and then you switch to married filing separately, and you get your big balance forgiven with a more efficient payment too. So there's all kinds of complexities with these small debt forgiveness. So it's kind of like your typical 30, 35K debt borrower can get forgiveness. But because of this accelerated forgiveness time for a lot of people that have small debts, you're really talking about you know even more people getting forgiveness, right? There's a ton. There's probably, I think, 10, 15 million people that have very small debts. So you're t you, know, you, you hear 40 million people have student loans. Well, there's a huge diversity of of, of people within that 40 million, right? Like a huge number, like a very large group of people owes a very moderate amount. And within the people that owe that very moderate amount, there's really kind of two types of people. One, one person is doing just fine. They just haven't gotten around to paying off their loans yet. Maybe because they're wondering about cancellation. Maybe they're just kind of just putting things off or whatever. Uh, and then there's a group that's really struggling, a group of people that's really having a hard time economically. And and that tends to be people that have very small amounts of debt. And then, of course, you've got the higher income folks and the grad school folks who, you know, so many folks for those situations, they go for um, forgiveness because grad school's unlimited borrowing, right? That's a big thing that people don't think about, that undergrad's super capped and the balances for borrowing for undergrad haven't changed in years, because the Higher Education Act hasn't been updated in years. So that's something to think about, too. If this save plan sticks around, you know, will you have some sort of giant bargain compromise bill that comes out at some point? Well, let's say, like, Republicans hold the Senate, Biden wins, Democrats win the House. That's probably the best scenario for some sort of big compromise bill. And maybe, you know, Democrats agreed to you know, cap graduate borrowing, maybe they increase undergraduate borrowing, maybe they increase Pell Grants, maybe everybody gets a little bit of what they want. That's like the optimistic scenario. The uh, other scenario, of course, is that something very differently happens, right? Uh, but, you know, I think that what's clear with all these different scenarios is that student loans, in some ways, yes, in some, some ways it's simpler, but in a whole lot of ways it's way more complicated. I think that the Married filing separate and joint analysis is like way more complicated than it used to be. Uh, I think that the should I get on the pay or the save program, that's very complicated. I think the what should I do if, you know, Trump wins and the save plan gets removed and I don't have that option anymore, that option is, is fairly complicated. Um, even with this new IDR extension that's happened where you IDR uh, sort of recertification extension where nobody has to recertify before 2025, um, you know, for the most part, it seems, you know, that's complex as well because you have the IDR waiver expiring at the end of April 30th. Uh, and then a lot of people need to consolidate, but that would reset people's payments and those payments could last until, you know, mid to late 2025 in some cases now. So, you know, a lot's going on, like seems to be usually the case with student loans. So, you know, if, if you are wondering about pursuing forgiveness, is this a stable thing for me to do? I've got a couple suggestions, right? Take the money that you would put into your student loans and do something else positive with it. And that positive thing that you can do can also just be taking care of yourself. I tell you, the more I get, the older I get, the more and more I think about how important it is to take care of your mental health, physical health, um, spiritual health, uh, whatever it is that you're dealing with, you know, Make sure that you invest in yourself because, frankly, you know, if you're a young person, your human capital, which is your future stream of earnings, is far bigger than any financial investment that you have currently or that you could have, right? So if you think about yourself as a, um, a, a portfolio of, fi of finances, if you want to think about yourself like that, just in a pure financial, you know, you know, sense of things, what happens to everybody is you start off young and your financial assets are very small and your future earnings are very large. As you age and become mid-career, 
you have a lot more financial assets, but still substantial human capital earnings left to make in your lifetime. And at the later part of your life, when you're closer to retirement or in retirement, your future stream of human capital earnings is very small to non-existent because you're not going to make any more income from wages or salaries or, you know, active work. And then your financial assets are really large. And then you're really balanced heavily towards financial assets, right? So I would say that given that, you know, you as a financial being or somebody that has a lot of future stream of earnings, probably if you're listening to this, you know, make sure you invest in yourself. Now that doesn't mean go, uh, you know, blow tons of money on a completely unnecessary home renovation like I did. Oops. I'll probably have a podcast to talk about everything that I learned about um, why HGTV is not real life. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, invest in yourself of whatever makes you happy, right? Take the money that you would have put into your loans. And if you're nervous about forgiveness, go get a massage. <laughs> if you're nervous about forgiveness, go increase your 401k contribution that regularly gets withdrawn from your paycheck. If you are nervous about forgiveness, uh, just go for a run or go to the gym or go watch your favorite movie, right? Um, there are lots of hacks that you can use. Obviously, that's why Student Loan Planner exists, uh, to save money and lower your costs, lower your payments. And um, But the thing is, is just, you know, I would just prefer that you take care of yourself. That's really, really important. Um, so if you want to ask any questions for the pod, uh, we will probably take some questions here in a future episode. You can leave a uh, a voicemail at studentloanplanner.com slash voicemail. And if you have any other non student loan questions, I'd love to hear those too. I'd love to hear what's on your mind. If you listen to this pod, I want to make it fun for you. And so if you have any just general financial questions as a student loan borrower that you're dealing with or things that you're considering, uh, go ahead and ask away. And uh, just, I really thank you so much for listening to this podcast. You know, like I said, I know that we are not um, talking about the lives of the rich and famous. We're not doing murder mysteries. We're not um, talking about some really exciting news thing that happened. Uh, so the fact that you listen to this, of course, means a lot to me and everybody at SLP. Uh, if you do need a plan, if you need a, a new plan because you're a new client or you need a refresh, you can go to studentloanplanner.com slash book. And then if you are a wealth client, reach out to your advisor and we will probably share more ways in future podcasts on uh, other services that we offer uh, to help you out if they're something that you're interested in. So studentloanplanner.com slash book if you need help and studentloanplanner.com slash voicemail if you want to leave a quick question for the show that we'll cover in a future episode. Thank you everyone for listening and have a wonderful rest of your week.